services return to more normal, whatever normal is for us. Um, we used to, if you remember, we had a worship group and we will return to that, um, have songs, have a block of songs. Well, that was difficult when you're just having to watch and listen, but because we can sing today, we are going to have at least a block of two. So we're going to stand and sing, first of all, Happy Day, and then secondly, The Lion and the Lamb. And let's sing out our praises to God. Uh, it might be behind a mask, but hey, that won't get in the way. <laughs> so, so let's stand and sing as uh, Matt brings up uh, the songs on I Sing for us. Thank you, Matt. Of the world, 
His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee. just share us a little bit about boys brigade um if you remember they're looking for volunteers and lizzie is one of the workers there um, because she's self-isolating she can't come into the building so we've had to uh, flex and we're going to do it from zoom so uh, thank you matt good morning everybody uh sorry i can't be there i wish i could uh, but I'm stuck here for another day or two. Um, so, um, yeah, so you'll have noticed, as Jonathan said, that the Boys Brigade at the moment is looking for um, volunteers. So I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an intro for those of you that don't know um, into what Boys Brigade actually is. So it's one of the biggest Christian youth organisations in the UK. Um, and first, Saffron Walden Company has been running for uh, 40 years, coming up for 41, I think. Um, so it's a, a long standing. Uh, company um, and the idea behind Boys Brigade is that it's an opportunity for children and young people who are aged from five up to 18 um, to grow and learn and discover in a caring environment uh, which is rooted in the Christian faith um, and that's what makes it different to a lot of other um, youth organisations that are operating in the town so things like the Scouts and the Beavers and so on the fact that it is rooted in the Christian faith and it runs and operates out of the church um, in the case of Saffron Walden out of the Baptist Church uh, and there's a huge range of activities um, everything from camping and kayaking to uh, first aid sport music craft um, and lots of others that I haven't mentioned um, so the boys develop skills and they grow in confidence and they make friends and they start to take responsibility um, and at the bottom of all of that they're learning about the Christian faith 
Um, so what's the need at the moment in terms of Saffron Walden? Um, well, two leaders have just stepped down after many years service um, from the junior section, which is the section for eight to 11 year olds. Um, and currently the junior section is the biggest that it's been for a long time. Um, there are um, regularly more than 17 boys who are attending on a weekly basis. Um, it runs uh, from on Tuesdays uh, from 6.30 till 7.45 at the Baptist Church. Um, and um, we really need some people to step into um, the roles within that section in particular. Now, there are possibilities of reshuffling the current um, staff that we have um, to uh, cover the need, but that obviously that leaves holes elsewhere. So we're really hoping that some people, and praying that some people will step in um, to fill those gaps. People will feel led um, to uh, take on those roles. Um, we are approaching parents as well, and parent helpers are, are great, but obviously a lot of the parents don't come from a Christian background and aren't um, churchgoers. Um, and we really want our leaders to um, be um, members of the local churches so that they're able to share their faith um, with the boys on a, on a weekly basis. Um, why do I volunteer? Well, I grew up, um, I was a brigade child. So my mum was captain of the girls brigade. My dad was captain of the boys brigade um, over in Melbourne. Um, and I have seen firsthand um, what boys brigade can do and the impact that it can have um, in children's lives. And I love what the boys brigade um, and the girls brigade stand for. And like I say, that difference um, between the brigades and the other um, youth organizations in the town in this fact that it's rooted um, within the Christian faith. So I started volunteering about seven years ago when William first started um, attending and I co-lead the anchor section which is the youngest boys, so that's the five to the eight year olds. Um, and William's now gone all the way up, he's in company section, Arthur's now in the juniors and they both absolutely love it. Um, and them and all of their friends uh, who are attending the um, brigades really missed it during lockdown when we couldn't um, operate properly and they're so thrilled to be back. So what we really don't want to happen is that these boys go back and there's no one to take them on um, because they're so keen um, to carry on and get back into it. Um, like I say, we offer a variety of activities. Um, so it may be that you feel like you could offer to help with one particular type of activity, something where you feel like you've got a hobby or a, a strength or a skill that you could share with the boys. Um, we also run weekly devotions as part of the sessions. Um, so maybe that's something you feel you could help with. Um, but it's so lovely to see the boys mixing across different schools, um, different family backgrounds. And as a volunteer, you get to build some really positive relationships, not just with the boys, but also with their families. Um, and to be a first hand experience for those families of um, of what it is to be a Christian. Um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for outreach. It's a wonderful opportunity to teach children about the Christian faith. Uh, starting with the little ones in anchors uh, by sharing Bible stories and simple prayers, moving all the way up to just before lockdown, we ran the Youth Alpha with our uh, company section and our seniors. Um, and I think it comes down to me for, um, to, to a verse from Proverbs, Proverbs 22, verse 6, uh, which says, start children off on the way they should go. Even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, I would just encourage you to take on board what Lizzie has said and think prayerfully about whether this could be you. Um, this church used to lead VBS for over 40 years until a couple of years ago. And although we led it, it was non-denominational and we were widely supported by the other churches in the town. The brigades are just the same. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't give in to the temptation to think, oh, that's another church's work. It's not, and our youngsters go to it. So please do think about that. We come to our prayers now. We include Boys Brigade and Listening to God and our pastoral prayers in this. Father, we do thank you for the work of the brigades, both Boys and Girls Brigade. And we know, Lord, that they are looking for more staff because there are lots of children wanting to come. And we want to thank you for that need. But we pray also, Lord, that you will meet that need. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Please, Lord, would you uh, ensure that those groups can continue in as good a way as possible. And we thank you, Lord, for the listening to God outreach in the marketplace yesterday. Thank you, Lord, for those conversations. Thank you for those prayers. Thank you for those words that you spoke into the uh, hearts and minds of the team. 
we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bring fruit out of this outreach. We thank you, Lord, for David Gardner um, and that he's been well enough after his operation to go with Sari to Hungary for the Bible translation work. We pray for this church, Lord. We just pray that you will protect us, that you will lead us, you will speak to us, and you will lead us onwards and make us, Lord, your obedient and fruitful people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're coming to communion. Um, in this church, we believe that communion is for any um, who love the Lord as their personal Lord and Saviour. Um, so if that's you, um, then please do take communion, whether you're at home, in which case you need to supply your own bread and wine, or whether you're here, in which case we'll bring it round. For children, they need to be old enough to understand uh, what they are doing and to have made their own personal commitment to Christ. As we return in our services to sort of more than normal pattern, and we're including more songs, um, it does probably mean the services will be a little longer. Um, so uh, that will... Um, certainly for this service and then back again in September. We tend to keep them a little shorter in August. But as we come to a time of communion, we're going to listen to a song as we distribute the bread and wine, but I just want to introduce it with a few words that I hope will speak to somebody today. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness, of your own gives you a right to come, but simply because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come when you are fearful to be made new in love. Come when you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come when you are regretful and be made whole. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Lord, as we come now to this table, as we take bread and wine, we ask, Lord, again, that we would receive you in our hearts by faith. Renew the presence of your spirit within us, Lord. Fill us once again. And as we reflect upon your death and your resurrection, and indeed your life lived here on earth, we give you our humble thanks. Where we have erred, Lord, where we have sinned, may we know and receive your forgiveness as we repent. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. 
privately, I, there's only one thing I have to say, love it. When it comes to praising God in song for the first time after I don't know how long, love it. <laughs> We're going to stand and sing again, love it, <laughs> when I survey the wondrous cross. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. And now, Lord, as Rachel comes to speak to us, we thank you, Lord, for this series in 2 Corinthians that has been difficult, but you've spoken powerfully. And we pray for Rachel as she speaks, Lord. Speak powerfully through her to us, of that love and sorrow mingled for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Hi, everybody. Morning. Great to see and hear us singing. It's amazing. So today we're going to be finishing. This is the last in our sermon series on 2 Corinthians. And I've really enjoyed this whole series. I hope you guys have. Um, I'm just going to give you a little update about what 2 Corinthians is, in case you weren't here for some of the, the sermons. So 2 Corinthians is a letter written by Paul the Apostle to the Corinthian church, and it's a letter that reflected quite troubled relationships at that time. The members of the church had kind of gone against Paul. So he's writing, he's not in Corinth at the time, and he's heard that some other pastors and ministers, super apostles, a bit tongue-in-cheek, have come along and they've led 
the Corinthians in the church a little bit away from the real gospel. So this letter is about Paul defending the genuineness of himself as an apostle and the genuineness of the gospel message that he has given to them. And it's very hard for Paul because Paul was the founder of that church. He knew all the people and he's feeling that they're, they're, they're against him and he has to defend himself. So in Corinth, 2 Corinthians, we were given a whistle stop tour really of Paul's immense hardships and persecutions from within and outside the church. And he talks about his trials and his pains. Yet at the end, which is what we're talking about today, the summary is that he is able to stand with confidence and conviction and say, you know what? I actually delight in my weakness because God is strong. And he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. So today we're going to ask God to show us how that could possibly work. How can we have strength in weakness? How can weakness and suffering be a strength that we could even be content or boast about it? So I'm just gonna pray, Lord, I pray that you speak to us all this morning. Thank you for speaking to me as I've prepared this. And I pray that somehow you speak to us all today in your name, amen. So we're gonna pick up in chapter 11. I'm gonna be reading some parts of chapter 11 and chapter 12. I'll jump around a little bit. And it starts really, Paul is defending himself as an apostle against these kind of new shiny competitor leaders that are in Corinth, that are very proud and boastful of their credentials. Um, the other thing that has been sort of, that Paul has been criticized about from the Corinthians is that he doesn't have enough sort of spiritual visions and dreams. He doesn't have that experiential, you know, he hasn't shown enough of it. So they don't know if he's really a true believer. So chapter 11, verse 21. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I must be out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes. Three times I was beaten. I was pelted with stones. I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day at open sea. He goes on. I have labored and toiled and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've been cold and naked. <clears throat> Besides all of this, I face daily pressure of my concern for the churches and the church members. Who is weak and I don't feel weak on their behalf. Verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. <clears throat> then skipping to chapter 12, verse 5, he's defending his credentials. He talks about the fact that he has had actually very amazing spiritual visions. But he doesn't really want to talk too much about it. He says in, in verse 5, that experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I'm going to refrain so that no one will think of me more than is warranted. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded to the Lord, take it away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. My grace is sufficient for you. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is a very strange statement. It's a very topsy-turvy statement. It's a very, it's a paradox. How in the, what does it even mean? What could it even look like that I'm strong in weakness? You know, Paul faced trials, persecutions, 
He was undermined by his own church, family, competition. He had afflictions in his body, yet he's able to be confident in those weaknesses. And how, how could that be true? So we're going to look at a few elements, Matt, if you can show the next slide, of Paul's sufferings that have come up throughout the two Corinthians series we've been doing. We're going to look at those weaknesses where he looks weak to others, where he's had to deny himself. We're going to look at the persecution and suffering he's had from external people coming in. We've heard about lashing, stonings, shipwrecks. And we're also going to look at this issue of thorn in the flesh, a personal affliction that he had to carry that God wouldn't remove. So we're going to just look at those types of things that were going on with Paul and see what we can learn from it. So first, Paul had to defend himself and his authenticity as an apostle against his own church family. He was being challenged on his credentials and on his spiritual experiences. And in fact, he had all the credentials of the perfect apostle. He really did. He matched and outstripped the credentials of any other apostle. He had visions and dreams. He knew Hebrew back to front. He knew the Torah, the law. He was very well educated. He was great in theology. And he could have easily said, you know what? I am great. I'm really great. These are all the things that I'm really good at. But he, it made him cringe to do this. It was like, oh, I don't want to do this. But because you Corinthians, that's insi you're insisting on seeing some shiny person. I'm going to have to tell you. I'm going to have to say, okay, I do have these things, but I'd really rather not be telling you about it. And he says, my message and my lifestyle should be sufficient to display my genuine, authentic relationship with Christ. And I was thinking there are actually weak ways that we can reveal God. And there are strong ways that we can reveal God. So if I was come to you today and say, you know, Barry, do you know, I'm, I got a theology degree from Cambridge a couple of years ago. And um, I grew up as a missionary kid. So I'm pretty, you know, and I had a really good vision the other night. I saw God come to me and you, you might think, gosh, Rachel, she's really spiritual, right? You probably wouldn't, but, anyway. but um, you might say, oh, Rachel, you know, she's really connected to God. She's super spiritual. She knows what she's read the Bible. And you might end up glorifying me or a leader when you think, gosh, they, they tick our Christian box. But it goes back to what I was talking about a few weeks ago. You'd be glorifying the container, the clay, but you wouldn't be glorifying my, the contents, what I'm carrying, the treasure I'm presenting. So Paul, by boasting in visions and spiritual experiences or his Hebrew credentials, that would have been a very weak way to reveal God. That would have been revealing himself and his strength as a human. And he says, I won't do that. I won't do that. I will not boast and seek to self-promote and self-exalt. In fact, self-promotion is the antithesis of the gospel of Christ. Self-focus is completely at odds with what Jesus calls us to. Luke 9.23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. If you wish to follow Jesus, you need to take up your cross. If I wish to follow Jesus, I need to take up my cross, deny myself, whatever that might be in my life that I need to lay down. And we need to be prepared to look weak. Paul was prepared to say, I'm not going to boast except in the cross of Jesus Christ. So even though Paul's credentials were genuine, it was not the basis of his authority. His authority and his genuine nature as a follower of Christ is shown by the fact he was prepared to pick up his cross. He was prepared to look weak. He was prepared to be mocked and flogged and rejected. Wow, what, what would that even look like in present day? What would it look like to just take up your cross? So I've, um, I told some of you last time I preached that I'd been reading these stories about Jesus freaks that some of you knew about that Phil Clark lent to me. And there's hundreds of them. I've got two volumes here. I'm not going to read them all to you just now. But I'm going to give you a story 
uh, one guy called Ivan. Ivan, 18 year old um, soldier in the USSR, the Soviet time, 1970, the story. There's plenty of up to date stories and there's plenty going back through the centuries. But Ivan had um, been kept in a communist camp because he was a Christian and he was refusing to deny his faith. And the communists were endlessly trying to re-educate him, to tell him, you know what, you need to stop talking about God. And I'm going to just give you some quick excerpts because we haven't got time for it all. But it was lunchtime, the sun was shining brightly, and he'd been called to see the commander. Ivan walked along the snowy pavement and he praised God for this time alone, time to sing and pray. The morning was so bright, at first he didn't notice, but suddenly it caught his eye, a bright star began to fall from heaven. It was like a comet and it came closer and bigger. He looked up and he saw an angel above him, bright and powerful. He was full of joy, but fear. And the angel didn't descend all the way to earth, but it hovered about 200 yards from the ground. And it walked in the air and it spoke to him and said, Ivan, go, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Ivan couldn't speak, but he was overjoyed. Anyway, he went to the commander's office and there was a big discussion and the commander said, why aren't you learning the correct answers? Why will you not deny God? And Ivan said, I can't, I can't accept what I know to be untrue. I can only follow what I know to be true. And the commander said, but no one can prove the existence of God. Even priests and pastors can't. He said, sir, they may speak about not being able to prove God, but there was no question about knowing him. He's with me. And before I came in here, he sent an angel to encourage me. So the commander had no choice. He said, okay, right, Ivan, I'm sorry, but that's it. You know, we've had enough. You are gonna to have to stand outside in the freezing cold, minus 13 degree temperature after, you know, um, the, the dinner call tonight. And you're gonna to have to do that until you say you don't believe in God. And not only that, you're gonna to have to do it in your summer uniform. So it goes through the, the nights when Ivan was there in his thin summer uniform and it was no help in the bitter cold. He watched his clock. It was one minute after 10 p.m. Tonight, he would have a long time to pray, but for the first time since he'd been in the army, prayer didn't come easily. He was worried. Could he stand out there all night? What if he froze to death? The what ifs floods his mind. And he remembered the angel who'd visited him that morning. The angel said, don't be afraid. And suddenly he realized the angel's words had been for tonight. So he prayed and he carried on praying. Soldiers came and checked on him every hour they were in the thick, heavy winter coat. They were freezing and he wasn't even shivering. And they said, you know, Ivan, don't you want to go in? Don't you want to go in? And he said, I can't. I cannot. And they said, do you plan to stand out here all night? He says, I don't see how anything else is possible. And God is helping me. He was able, he, he had to do this for 12 nights. And he was able to pray and sing and um, witness to soldiers. Soldiers around him were converted and impressed by his faith. Anyway, later on, he was then subjected to much heavier torture. And by, at the age of 20, Ivan knew that the communists would kill him. On July the 11th, 72, he wrote to his parents, you'll not see me anymore. Do not grieve for me, dear parents. It's because I love Jesus more than myself. I listen to him, though my body does fear somewhat. I do this because I do not value my life as much as I value him. And he described a vision of angels that was sent to strengthen him. A few days later, his body was returned to his family. It showed he'd been stabbed six times around his heart. He had wounds on his head and around his mouth. There were signs of beatings on his whole body. And then he'd been drowned. And the colonel, his commander said, Ivan died with difficulty. He fought with death, but he died as a Christian. And his father wrote, may it be that this living flower which gave the fragrance of its youth on the cross should be an example for all faithful youth. May they love Christ as our son loved him. So that's pretty harsh. There's a whole volumes of these. It's not a one-off, oh, that's unusual. It's not unusual. People who are strengthened by God, even though they're broken and weak, God carries them through. It's a supernatural paradox it's a spiritual thing that we can't completely understand that when we're broken and weak as christians we cling to god more 
And as we do that, his power shines through us in a way that we're actually able to praise him despite the suffering, despite the pain. And the way we carry our burdens, despite the sufferings, it's evidence of the Holy Spirit in us. In fact, Colossians 1, 24, Paul says, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I mean, that's an amazing testimony, but Paul, of Ivan, of many others, that they are able to glorify him in the midst of suffering. And we too, as Christians, follow this pattern of ministry. We are called to the same pattern. Fortunately for us, it's not gonna be quite as extreme as Ivan and Paul and Jesus and many others, but there are trials and afflictions that we are faced with and we're weakened and humbled by and God uses it as a platform for his glory if we let him. So Paul said he's got a thorn in his flesh, right? So he talks about all these other sufferings, but he's also carrying a thorn in his flesh. And the commentary said that this is probably a physical disability. It could have been a speech impediment. It might have been a limb, but other commentators say it could be that he was tormented by a temptation that wouldn't leave him, that he's constantly being tempted by something. But Paul said he was given, why was he given the thorn in his flesh? Because, you know, he had amazing credentials. He could have exalted himself above any of us or any of the apostles then. And that would have probably been a real temptation for Paul to do that, a real tendency. He might have him to say, actually, I'm really qualified at this. And if he had been tempted to exalt himself, that would have actually cut out the very heart of the gospel message if he'd have tried to draw attention to himself. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, he said he was given a thorn in his flesh to remind him of his weakness, to buffet me so I would not become prideful. And Paul begged God for deliverance from this thorn. He said, take this from me. He said, I said it three times. In fact, it was probably more than three. Three was probably just the, the number used to say, he begged God, take this away from me, it's tormenting me. And three times God said, no, no, no. It's come up reminiscent, isn't it, of Jesus's cry in Gethsemane when he said, take this cup from me, God, take it, I can't bear it. God says, no, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Why wouldn't God remove that from him? Have you ever wondered why God doesn't remove thorns and pains and afflictions from your life? or from other people's lives, people you love. God says, actually, no. Why doesn't he remove those things? Maybe because he's got a better plan for you, for me, for his body. Maybe because of this strange paradox that his power is perfected through our weakness. You know, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, when I was thinking and being called, I believe, to step into some ministry work here, I felt afflicted by the whole variety of things. Some external, people were questioning whether I could be called, maybe because of my gender. There was some discouragement from people from in, internally as well. There were some heavy pastoral situations that caused me to be very burdened. And I also had some temptations in myself, the way I was thinking through things. And I did actually struggle a lot and I went off on a retreat at that time actually and um, I was praying Lord you know is this really what I should be doing I'm not sure you know I've actually got a job in the secular world I've got my family how's this all going to work and um, I went down to a little chapel in the retreat center and it was just a short um, reflection that the minister or the priest was giving and he focused on David Psalms 119 verse 71 it said it was David said, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. It was good for me to be afflicted so I might learn your decrees. And that stuck in my head at that time. I was thinking, gosh, okay, hopefully I'm going to learn something from these afflictions. Because David was able to look back and say, it was good that I was afflicted because I learned something about God's heart. And I don't know anyone who I think would say that they enjoy being afflicted emotionally, mentally, or physically. Affliction is painful, 
It's difficult and sometimes it's absolutely bewildering and crushing. In fact, affliction is a really heavy language. It means to be bowed down, to be humbled, to be brought. Humbled, not in a positive way, like I'm humble, but be humbled so that you feel less important, crushed. And there are many things that can do this to us. There are circumstances into which we go that humble us, that bring us low. People with whom we have to deal with that humble us. And some do it with the best of intentions, others do it with the worst of intentions. But it brings you, it can bring you down. Your, your physical, your health might bring you down. There are afflictions in our minds, temptations that bring us down. Yet David says, it was good that that happened to me. Paul says, I take pleasure in my afflictions. So what, what enables them to say that? What, what, how could they have a perspective where you say that's a good thing? Well, for sure, they're looking beyond the immediate moment of their suffering. And they're not talking about the affliction itself. They're not saying this is great, I feel good, but they're talking about the effects, the consequences that come out of that affliction. Perhaps there was a sinful pattern of thought or behavior that it was exposed or crushed on account of the affliction. Or perhaps David and Paul learned something about the statutes of God, perhaps a particular insight into God's word or a grasp on it that they wouldn't have gained. And maybe due to the affliction, they understand better the limits and boundaries for a righteous course of living. So affliction is the context in which people are proved, Christians are proved, or they advance in obedience and they cling to the Lord as it happens. And there may be something, or there is something missing. Jesus Christ, he learned obedience by suffering things. And as he went on in his calling, he felt more and more pressure and it was brought to bear on him, yet he went on proving his commitment to God and his commitment to his calling. You know, this has clear implications for us as Christians. There may be things that we learn in the school of affliction and suffering that we wouldn't never learn in the school of pleasure and delight. I'm not saying there's nothing to learn in, the, in that space, but and Paul's not promoting suffering as the only way to display God's glory, but it certainly is one way. And Paul was certainly called that way. And we might also have that call put on us at different points in our lives. And you know, if you've had any experience of affliction in your Christian life, you know, and I know to some measure, that it can be an exceedingly painful occasion. There are times when you feel totally undone. Yet if that suffering or affliction weans you off your sin or exposes your pride or arrogance or ignorance then it teaches us um, where our limitations are and we can be come to god we're more likely to come to god to be instructed so if, if if we believe which we should do as christians that god is in these things to bring us to himself to train us then we should be able to at some point know that we're going to look back and say it was good that i went through that because it allowed God to be strong. I learnt about God, but also God was able to shine through me. Something I just think is important to point out, it's critical to point out that Paul was not claiming that he had mastered self-denial and therefore he's above the other apostles. You know, I'm really good at denying myself, therefore I'm a good apostle. No, because that would have just been boasting and proudful. Prideful. He you know, he and we, we cannot manufacture weakness. We can't say, oh, I'm going to not boast so that I look good. We don't have the ability to manufacture that. Paul is saying that weakness is actually real suffering and powerlessness because we're under the real power of sin. So weakness, he's not just saying, oh, you're weak because you've got, you know, a health problem. Weakness it's because of our existence under the power and consequences of real sin, right? And we as ourselves, we can't subdue sin on our own. Right? You can't just say, I'm going to do a bit of positive thinking and mindfulness training. I'm going to teach myself to be a better person. Or I'm going to stop feeling tempted by going to this course or counsellor. In fact, we don't need more willpower to get over this. We actually need more power by God's grace. And that's why... 
Paul says, in fact, the only verse in 2 Corinthians that's in red, Jesus actually said it to him, God said it to him, is my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. That's what you need. It's only by relying on God's grace and his kindness that we're able to become weak. We can't do it on our own, to put sin and pride aside and to persevere. So if you're trying to do it on your own, overcome weaknesses and sufferings and afflictions, you're gonna fail. You know, you're gonna have to rely on a supernatural act of deliverance where you say, God, yes, your grace is sufficient for me. Just like Jesus in the garden when he said, help me through this, God carried him through it. Just like Ivan was sent angels to empower him through that weakness. He wouldn't have been able to do it on his own. There's no way he could have done it on his own. Paul, the apostle, could not have done it on his own. We cannot do it on our own. <clears throat> we have to ask God to help us to endure these weaknesses, temptations, and sufferings. So if we're following God's call, and we are under the real power of sin and the consequences of sin, we need to pray earnestly about deliverance from these things. And only God's grace is going to deliver us from that. Only God's grace. So I'm going to um, wrap up, but I want to say that I, so I went and I did, some of you will know, a theology course some years ago, and I finished it about a year and a half ago. And when we ended the course, it was in Cambridge, I was doing it with a lot of ordinands. And we were asked by the college, can you just write a little blurb about what you'll take with you from this course? And then it all got put, you know, with our pictures and a little blurb about what we felt about the course um, in a newsletter and sent out to us. And I quickly skimmed it. This is like a year and a half ago I skimmed it. But when I was preparing for this, this um, sermon today, I remembered it. And I saw this guy, James, an ordinant, <clears throat> and he had written... In this little book, the key thing I'm taking with me from this college experience is the knowledge that being in the place of weakness forces you to be in a place of prayer and therefore to be in a place of strength. And I was, and I remember it hitting me at that time. And when I was praying for this, I thought, yes. He said, the key thing I'm taking with me is the knowledge that being in a place of weakness forces you to be in a place of prayer, which therefore you're in a place of strength. And that's exactly how the economy of God works. God uses us, those clay pots we were talking about, with our vulnerabilities and weaknesses and brokenness. We throw ourselves on him. We depend on him. And in doing that, there's a supernatural spiritual transaction where he gives us strength. And his glory is shone out through us. And so in that way, our afflictions can be a platform for God's glory if we let him and we let him use us. We don't say in the middle of an affliction, I'm great, I'm really enjoying this God, but we know and we can be content knowing that we're gonna, there's going to be good fruit in me, in others, and therefore we can be content. We're not happy, but we're like, yes, I can be because I know God, you're at work in this, I trust you, and we can be content. <clears throat> so he is the vine, we are the branches. As we cling to him, the sap of the vine kind of flows through him into us and it strengthens us. Then the harder we cling, the harder we throw ourselves on him, his strength can be displayed more. That's how it works. That's what Paul, that's what 2 Corinthians is telling us. And that fruit, that fruit that we get, because it all sounds a bit scary, but that fruit that we get is we learn his heart. He teaches us his ways. We are transformed. And we're filled with his spirit, just like Paul, just like Jesus, just like Ivan. God's spirit comes in and we're able to have a deep sense of contentment and joy despite the pain. So I'm just going to pray now and then we're going to have our last song. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for... The Apostle Paul and that letter he wrote to the Corinthians and all the things, the timeless truths from you that he was able to, through his suffering and pain and all he went through, he was called to put it all down in writing and it was preserved for us to learn about your heart and the way that you want us to live. And I pray, Lord, that you are with all of us. There's some of us here with big afflictions, health, physical, but also 
perhaps temptations, afflictions that tempt, Lord, pray that you do remove those from us. But if you don't, help us to be content knowing we will. There will be fruit. There will be fruit. And you will be glorified. In your name, amen. So we're going to sing uh, the last song. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here, you were there before the world began. Like a rose, 
trampled on the ground. That is what Jesus did for us. He took the fall and thought of you and me. And this is not just for those who are employed by the church. We are all ministers. And there is pain and suffering and temptation and angst in our lives. And God can bring good out of it. It may not be good, but he can bring good out of it. But he calls us to that life, to follow in the footsteps of Christ. And there may be some of you who are struggling and suffering. There may be some of you who feel like this trampled rose. And we would like to offer you prayer. So if you would like prayer, then please do come forward after the service and one of us will pray with you. But it's not because we glorify suffering. It's because God glorifies himself through our suffering. So let's just close with a blessing, but please, please don't go away despondent. <laughs> That's a heavy message today. Thank you, Rachel. Um, but God does glorify himself through it, and he, just as he glorified himself through our singing earlier. And the key is the word grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.